The fifth annual Louisiana Book Festival attracted 12,000 participants to downtown Baton Rouge and represented over 100 authors. Join us as we celebrate readers, writers, and their books with highlights from the 2007 Louisiana Book Festival. Featuring Yusef Komonyaka, winner of the Louisiana Writer Award. From the Capitol Building to the State Library, the festival is packed with activities for all ages and interests. The Book Festival is also an opportunity for Louisiana's outstanding writers to be recognized for their literary contributions. A Pulitzer Prize winning poet, Yusef Komonyaka is a native of Bogalusa. The Louisiana Center for the Book in the State Library honored him with the 2007 Louisiana Writer Award for his distinguished contributions to Louisiana's literary heritage. Komonyaka has produced several award-winning books of poetry during his writing career. He's drawn upon his childhood experiences in Bogalusa and later those in Vietnam. I was living in New Orleans teaching at uh, UNO uh, when, I, when I started um, writing about my experience in Vietnam. I'm just going to read a few of those poems um, about Vietnam. Camouflaging the Chimera. We tied branches to our helmets. We painted our faces and rifles with mud from a riverbank, blades of grass hung from the pockets of our tiger suits. We wove ourselves into the terrain, content to be a hummingbird's target. We hugged bamboo and leaned against the breeze off the river, slow dragging with ghosts from Saigon to Bangkok, with women left in doorways, reaching in from America. We aimed at dark-hearted songbirds. In our way station of shadows, rock apes tried to blow our cover, throwing stones at the sunset, chameleons, crawl our spines, changing from day to night, green to gold, gold to black. But we waited till the moon touched metal, till something almost broke inside us. VC struggled with the hillside, like black silk, wrestling iron through grass. We weren't there. The river ran through our bones. Small animals took refuge against our bodies. We held our breath, ready to spring the L-shaped ambush as the world revolved under each man's eyelid. Next poem is entitled Thanks. Thanks for the tree between me and the sniper's bullet. I don't know what made the grass weigh seconds before the Viet Cong raised his soundless rifle. Some voice always followed, telling me which foot to put down first. Thanks for deflecting the ricochet against that anarchy of dust. I was back in San Francisco, wrapped up in a woman's wild colors, causing some dark bird's love call to be shattered by daylight when my hands reached up and pull a branch away from my face. Thanks for the vague white flower that pointed to the gleaming metal, reflecting how it is to be broken like mist over the grass as we played some deadly game for blind gods. What made me spot the monarch on a single thread tied to a farmer's gate, holding the day together like an unfingered guitar strain is beyond me. Maybe the hills grew weary and leaned a little in the heat. Again, thanks for the dud hand grenade tossed at my feet outside Chulai I'm still falling through silence. I don't know why the intrepid sun touched the banner, but I know that something stood among those lost trees and move on to when I move. And the last poem is the second poem I wrote actually in this sequence, um, Face It. My black face fades, hiding inside the black granite. I said I wouldn't, damn it, no tears. I'm stone, I'm flesh. My clouded reflection eyes me like a bird of prey, the profile of night slanted against morning. I turn this way, the stone lets me go. I turn that way, I'm inside, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial again, depending on the light to make a difference. I go down the 58,022 names, half expecting to find my own, Letters like smoke. I touch the name Andrew Johnson. I see the booby trap's white flash, name tremor, and a woman's blouse. But when she walks away, the names stay on the wall. Dress strokes flash, red bird's wings cutting across my stare. The sky, a plane in the sky, 
A white vexed image floats closer to me, and then his eyes look through mine. I'm a winter. He's lost his right arm inside the stone. In the black mirror, a woman's trying to erase names. No, she's brushing a boy's hair. The ancient tale of Gilgamesh was the subject of a panel discussion with Yusef Komonyaka and theater producer Chad Gracia. The two have co-written Gilgamesh, a verse play, which has been published and is now the subject of a stage production. How many people are familiar in general with the story of Gilgamesh and, and, and where it came from? And, okay, about half the people. So since Dave is not here, maybe give a very, very brief um, description of, of where it came from. That explains yeah why I was interested in and why Yusuf and I did this. It's, it's based on a real person, a historical person, Gilgamesh, who ruled in Ur, which is not far from modern day uh, Baghdad, in 2700 BC. People told great stories about his, about his exploits and then around 2000 it was, uh, it was codified into Babylonian and Akkadian, well known throughout the region and around the time of Christ it was entirely lost not a trace. You could not have found a single person for 1,800 years that uh, knew, would know what you were talking about if you had mentioned uh, the name Gilgamesh. Then through the heroic efforts of some fascinating characters that uh, Mr. Damrosh's book uh, chronicles, it was over 60 years uh, translated into, it was, you know, they, they were able to, to, uh, to crack the code. And um, I stumbled upon the story when I was a teenager and the first thing that that really struck me was that this was the first story that human beings had told and I assumed that since it was 4,600 years old that it would be very foreign and um, that it it would read like one of those king's lists that, that you find um, yeah. in those yeah. cuneiform piles but actually for those of you who know the story it's quite modern. It deals with all of the largest questions that, uh, that people have to confront today. It's psychologically astute. It is, in short, the story of how a man deals with the loss, uh, the loss of his great love, his great friend, and how he, um, his response is to search for immortality. And he tries many approaches, and he goes on a great journey, and, encounters speaking scorpions and bartenders at the edge of the universe and uh, dark seas and he discovers a man who later became Noah in uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition and um, eventually comes to terms with the fact that he is human and, and he must die. So that was the story that attracted me. For many, many years I worked in theater and in the back of my mind, I thought I'd love to bring this to stage, but I didn't know who, um, who the collaborator would be. I went to a reading of, uh, of Yusuf's work and um, was immediately struck by the power of his language and his experience uh, writing about war and loss. And, uh, and Gilgamesh takes place in a, in a, in a, uh, a very warlike society. So we decided to uh, roll up our sleeves and try to, to make an adaptation while being true to the story that would also uh, survive on, on stage. How do you work uh, with the issue of what you take from the uh, original epic and what do you change to make it a drama and, and make it uh, appealing to contemporary readers? It was a challenge, essentially, um, and I'm sort of open for challenges as such. And um, when when Chad first posed a question, I said to myself, I said, this is impossible for me as such because I'm attracted to drama. I've read drama, attended plays and what have you, but I had also read versions of Gilgamesh. And I realized that I had to choose a language that wasn't an exactly parallel language to the translations. I wanted to choose a language that was highly figurative, uh, imagistic. Um, I was quite 
taken with the fact that within the context of the narrative, there are numerous um, surreal moments. And I'm always challenged by surreal, the, the surreal element. I agonize about, about this project before I said yes. And finally, I wrote a phrase down. And by writing the phrase down, I discovered the language I wanted to tell, retell this very traditional world story. Um, so, and the other thing is that I wanted a language that wasn't completely, I, I didn't want an abstract language. I wanted a language that facilitated the stage as such. And that was the most important thing. Um, I wanted a certain cadence and rhythm, rhythm as such. I wanted a language that, when we think about the contemporary psyche, um, it is still contained by the contemporary psyche. Uh, so I, um, I wanted a language that, that didn't seem archaic, um, if that makes sense. Um, a language that we could trust. Um, it's such an interesting story. Um, the thing about friendship, that's, that's what's interesting about this story, is that um, Inkidu, who's really described as an individual outside of, um, he's not even thought of as a man. Not, no, no, not really, you know. Uh, language is what humanizes him. So I, I knew that that would be part of the ritual as such. He had to discover how to speak. Because if we think about um, the ancient texts, um, it's, a, it's a ritual. Um, it perfectly made for a stage. This is what I feel, once I started writing it. And our process is that I would write a few pages and then send those pages to Chad, and Chad would contact the actors, and I would hear, I would hear the pieces, you know, within the context of a few days sometimes. And that is, the, it was a rhythm of working that way um, that, that made it, that made this possible, I think. How did you work with the fact that, of course, in the uh, Gilgamesh that comes down to us, there are many gaps. There's a, there were <laughs> tablets, uh, a lot of the tablets apparently will, were not and will never be discovered. There's, there's a lot of gaps in the text, whereas you've written a, a cohesive drama that all hangs together and, and moves in a certain way, and you certainly don't try to reflect those ellipses. So how did you work with the, blanks, the blank spots in the epic? In a few different ways. Uh, yeah, yeah. First of all, the, the standard 12 tablets, we have maybe 70% of those tablets. Uh -huh. So yeah. if you look at, you know, a lot of the academic uh, translations of Gilgamesh are full of ellipses, as right. he says. Yeah. And then Gilgamesh said, and then pick blank, up, blank, blank. You, know, 20, you know, 20 lines later, uh -huh. we're somewhere else. However, there are other fragments that yeah. can reasonably be, um, other fragments from different periods that can reasonably in be inserted into there. So we used many different yeah. translations to, to get it to about 90%. The other 10%, I would say half of that we have we filled in just because there are sort of obvious, there are obvious um, set pieces that mm -hmm. were, that were uh, told throughout that region. And so we were able to insert some of those. In a very few cases, we just made stuff up, yeah, right, and uh, right, right. yeah, we just we, just, <laughs> we made things up. <laughs> we just made it, you know, and it was essential because you can't have a play and then you can't tell the audience, well, excuse us for a moment, we're going to have to have this character die without any explanation, and <laughs> right, right. so we had to, we had, but not 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 really too much. I think yeah. there's only a few, a few real additions that we that we made. As I recall, that specific in the you mentioned the introduction as well that that there's a character, the wine merchant's wife, I believe it is, who is not at all in the epic, but but that's a, that's that's, that's a, perhaps the the most uh, uh, extreme example of introducing brand new material. Could you talk about a little bit about what motivated you to add this new character and the role she plays as opposed to you know what happens in the epic? 
and so well, forth. Well, the, the, the idea is to, is to show different sides of Gilgamesh. Mm -hmm. And that was a, one way of showing his, because in many places, reference to his, um, to him being a bad uh, king is not really, um, it's not really droned out. It's not really um, evident with, uh, with, with examples. So we had to sort of invent certain examples. And I thought that was an interesting example, this tonally, um, that uh, he would be facing this person and um, how he, it's, it also deals with gender in, in a strange way, you know, um, that he is definitely a, a patriarch. And, uh, and, and I thought that was just one way of uh, depicting that as such. See, that's, the character has to be rounded in a certain mm -hmm. sense. And that puts another edge to this very interesting character um, and how brutal he can be. Uh, he's brutal with um, the hunter's son as well. Um, and here he is an, further into the play another side of his brutality, another moment of his brutality. And it also shows basically what he has to overcome, how he has to go through uh, this void, which is psychological uh, as well as a physical void, and how he comes out at the end, where he arrives, has he been changed? He's been changed by the voyage, and we realize the distance he has come. It's not just one hurdle he has overcome, but many hurdles as such. So, so, so that's, that's the reasoning behind that for me. And, and more specifically, just to talk for a moment about the, the process, we were really lucky we had some great actors yeah. that, uh, that would meet, as, as Yusuf said, every week we would, we would sit down and we would read it and talk about it and tear it apart. And, um, and then after every few months, we would have a more formal reading of a, a whole part of the play, part one. And then I, we would invite in theater professionals. And one of the things, and then we would ask for feedback. And one of the things that, that people said is, I, I know that you know that Gilgamesh is a bad king, but I'm not getting that. So that was one of the, <laughs> We had a few of those mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. coming from an audience, a friendly audience, and that's when Yusuf kind of went back to the drawing board and, mm -hmm. and, and returned with this, this wine, wine merchant's wife. One of the big things that Gilgamesh was, um, th the people were complaining to the gods because he was exercising the, the right of prima noctis. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Every, at every marriage ceremony, he <laughs> yeah. slept with the, with the bride before, before the husband. Right. Um, and so this, and, that, and that's, in the, that's in the epic, this brings that, it makes it really um, real. And you actually see a woman who's, um, who's now come back to, uh, to ask for help, and Gilgamesh is, 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 um, is furious with her for even asking. So based, it, based on a fragment from the, uh, from the text, but we, we tried to bring it to life so it would work on stage. What are we to make of the mysterious dreams of Gilgamesh and Enkidu? And uh, I was uh, looking again at the text, and you, you reference uh, specifically on page 33 uh, one of uh, Gilgamesh's dreams. He says, uh, this is uh, the second uh, stanza on page 33, I have again ushered a dream of flesh into flesh and left two men facing each other like an open wound, like two brutish brothers kneeling at their mother's feet. And I think that uh, this sort of, uh, this dream of confrontation is, uh, is, is fairly clear as far as the, the take on the mysterious dream. Uh, uh, could you talk a little bit about how you dealt with the, the issue of dreams in, in the play uh, as, as opposed to the sort of open-ended quality of the, the dreams, the, the, the lack of definitive, um, the lack of a, a ability to definitively interpret the dreams in the original epic? The whole piece at times seems like a dream sequence. That when, when I read it as such, um, and I think what gave me that idea, it had to do with 
the surreal element, the scarping people, um, the uh, stone sentinels even, that there's something about that, that the stone signal, uh, signal, uh, sentinels are almost like totems. They're almost like totems out of a very surreal dream. And, um, and I think maybe it was, the, it was that quality that influenced the language uh, that I could rely on poetry to, 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 to tell this as opposed to, uh, as opposed to prose. I began to trust the language that I'm used to, which is poetry. Um, and uh, I, I just think it has a lot to do with the emotional architecture of the piece as a whole. I think it's also one of the th one of the things that sets it in its time. Uh, this yeah. is a, this is an, an era when dreams meant m more than they do yeah. to the average you know to an average 21st century dweller. I mean, a lot of people, of course, still look to dreams for for insight. But at, at this point, these dreams that Gilgamesh is having, they are their messages from the gods, and so they have a whole different level of yeah. importance. And also, and they, 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 that's right, because dreams um, that. It's almost how people govern their lives mm -hmm. through dreams at, th at that particular time in history. So, so they're very tangible. Right. Another thing that, another question that's posed in the uh, introduction to uh, Gilgamesh in the uh, World Literature Anthology uh, that, that he finds to be open-ended uh, is the issue of the conclusion. And he poses the question, does the poem end in an affirmation of human culture in despair? And of course, in your conclusion, I hope it's okay to sort of give it away. The yeah. last lines are "Teach me," uh, the woman with the red sash. He's, 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 he's. We're ending sort of on a very open-ended sort of way. There's no closure. It's like he's realizing he has to uh, really learn how to be a good ruler, really learn the lessons of life, and he uh, that, that 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 there's still so much learning to be done. So I was wondering if you could sort of talk about the conclusion in that in the decision to make it open-ended, and specifically why you chose that you know, opening, ending it on a line like, teach me. Well, it's, it's an echo of an of a, of earlier um, <clears throat> moment where Gilgamesh says, Sidori, tutor me till stars tremble into water. Tutor me till a viper sheds the skin of a demigod, the sash of a bright garment in the morning light of dust. Tutor me till I am born backwards in time, and Sara does not know my name. Teach me how to be a king. Teach me how to die a man. So the, the end is an echo of that moment. Um, and that I, I've written a, a couple of, well, I've written for, 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 for opera as well, which invites music. And one thing about writing a libretto is that there's often repetition. And repetition becomes <clears throat> really the, um, the guiding cadence um, of the narrative, but also we can think about it as a kind of refrain as a, in a musical sense. So that, that maybe how that, how that ending came about. Does that, are you going to use music when you actually bring it onto the stage? Is that a, have you made decisions about that yet? How is that going to work? Uh, From the very beginning, we, we yeah. have talked about about having weaving music in to the uh, to the story, specifically music that's inspired from from uh, this part of the world, you know, some some Persian and and Arabic um, instruments, and you know, uh, mm -hmm. we have we have some musicians in mind actually yeah. that 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 we're working with for the 92nd yeah. Street Y. But yeah, I think Yusuf was very mm -hmm. clear, and I and I agreed from the beginning that there should be musicians on stage. They should be making music throughout and. And there are, there are songs throughout the text as well, mm -hmm. so yeah. ritual songs. I want to touch on what you said, oh. your question also quickly. Definitely for me, it's a hopeful ending. Um, mm. Just the very fact that Gilgamesh uses the, the verb teach me, mm. 
I mean, this is, this is so unlike him. I mean, he, he's, he's a brutal, small-minded, little, you know, he's, he's, a, he's terrified of, of death. He has no friends. He thinks he knows everything. For him to finally say, teach me, and he says this to, uh, to a barmaid, um, you know, someone he would have either, you know, just killed or you know, discarded, shows that he's learned something in his journey. And then at the very end, his final words also are, are teach me. And whether he learns all of the things that he needs to learn, I don't think it's as important as the fact that now he's open to, to trying to learn them. And um, he knows he's not going to find immortality, but the phrase I always use is that he has found a consolatory wisdom yeah. in its place. Yeah. And um, I think that's the best we can hope for. Louisiana Book Talks is produced in cooperation with the Center for the Book in the State Library of Louisiana and made possible in part by a grant from the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities.